If you register and let us know uh, that you're here, that can help us also to check and see who's not here, uh, to see who we might need to, to check in on and, and let them know that uh, we care and that they are loved. We invite you to rise in body or in spirit now to greet your neighbors. Uh, and when we hear the uh, piano uh, begin to play like come along, we'll know that is our invitation to return to our seats and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us greet our neighbors.
and with churches through, uh, through today and throughout time in reciting our beliefs through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. tomorrow. 
Um, that was a, a tough fall for her. I don't know how long she was down before she got help. I think it was a bit. So we want to remember her, and I'll just tell you that when um, Blake and I were out last week sick, um, there was one day when we opened the door and there was a little bag outside, and the bag had um, goodies, different kinds of things, and, and a note from Helen, and Helen had brought the bag, and she had walked, because she doesn't drive a car, she had walked all the way from her house, took her life in her hands to cross garden there, and um, came over to see me and left the bag, and then just left. And I thought that was so sweet. So um, we want to remember Helen and her prayers. Um, many of you are aware that there was a very, very tragic um, car accident here in Grand Prairie, either late Friday or early Saturday morning. One of our uh, members was uh, killed in that, and that's Camilla King. Um, so there were others riding with her that many of you will know, and that uh, they include um, Linda McNeff and Alice Ernst. Both Linda and Alice are in the hospital still, and um, one, at least one of them, is, is still fairly touch and go. I don't know which one, I don't know any details yet. But um, we do want to remember uh, the family of, of all of those folks involved um, and the folks who were in that car as well as the people who were at the party that they had left because I know there there's, it has to be in this feeling. They were leaving a, a 100th birthday celebration for um, a lady that many folks here uh, in town know. And so we just want to remember all of them because that is, is hard. And um, I'm reminded along with uh, Gail and Jean Wills who lost um, this last week a classmate's wife who had an aneurysm and died very quickly and they went to that funeral. I'm reminded how quickly life can end and how precious life is. And for some of those who had been at the party, what they remembered was how much fun Camilla was having there and um, how, how much joy she had. And so um, I think about that and I think about the preciousness of the gift of life. And it seems to me a good and fitting thing to go to prayer um, to thank God for um, her life, for our lives, for uh, the lives of those still hanging on. And for those of us, as we move forward, trying to discern how best to use the precious things of our life, let us run together as we pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, for indeed the gift of life is a precious gift. Even during dark times of God, times of illness or injury, times of grief and mourning, times when our hope is, is stretched very thinly indeed, if it's there at all, times of financial difficulty or employment difficulty or relationship or family turmoil, whatever it might be, we know that even still, life is good and you are God. You are the giver of the most precious thing we have, the gift of time, as well as the gift of salvation offered to us through Jesus Christ. So as we worship today, help us to do so in spirit and in truth, with glad hearts. Help us to look to you, O oh God, as we discern how best to move forward in our lives. There are those grieving deeply today. We lift them up before you and ask that you be very present with them. There are those who are confused and those who don't know what the future holds, and we ask that you be present with them, O oh God, for indeed none of us know. We are all your children, your creatures. You are our God and our creator. And we give you thanks and praise for all you give to us, and especially this day for the gift of time. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again for us and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
that deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. change in the bulletin. This is uh, something we've been planning for a while, but just to get in the bulletin. This is uh, Michael Carr, uh, charismatic Catholic priest. Sings one of my favorite songs, um, God's Own Fool. <laughs>
I saw the eighth day a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the, of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as, lo as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward is what straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. I'm so glad to be back here. I gotta tell you, um, I've not had a round of COVID before. That was my first. And I think it just saved up. That's what I think. Um, and I didn't just get it, but my husband got it too. So we were pretty miserable there together. And, and uh, um, appreciate so much having um, such an uh, understanding church family, and especially really good people I can count on, like um, like uh, Julie and like Dave and, uh, and, and like Chuck Edwards. And I know there's others out here who have the skill of being able to preach a sermon as well. It just means the world. Like I had a call from the conference office saying, hey, we need to scrounge up somebody for you. And I said, nope, got it under control. So um, it's good to have a deep bench because you never know when, when uh, your, your picture will get knocked out. We'll have to have several more in the line, right? So, but it's good to be back here today, and I appreciate everybody's prayers and well wishes. So, um, we are talking about postures of faith. We started uh, in the book of Philippians talking about the posture of humility and what it means. Uh, we, we read the part from Philippians 2 where Jesus pours out himself for us. And we talked about the humility that went in that and how when we vow to pray, that is a posture of humility. When we kneel, it is a posture of humility. When we, um, in some traditions, they lay prone, face down, that is a, to pray, that's a posture of humility. I've done that a time or two. Um, we also know that when we ask someone for forgiveness, at least I don't know who I am, I usually am looking down and asking for forgiveness because I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the fact I have to ask, right? And I'm reminded of, of my humanity in that. So then last week we talked about, or you all talked about through um, the help of, of uh, Julie, we talked about the posture of working out one's salvation. Now, um, the idea of working out salvation for some people sounds like what we call works righteousness. It sounds like we're working to get to heaven, and that's not what it means at all. A good Wesleyan knows, like us as Methodists in our Methodist tradition, know that um, it's not enough just to say yes to God and pray the sinner's prayer and then go off and live however you want. God expects us to grow in faith over time. And it's that process of growth that is what Paul means by working out one's salvation. It means you figure it out as you go. It means that there are ups and downs and things you're called to think about and do differently and things that stretch you. I've got a great Bible study coming up in January, speaking of stretching. If you want to do a great Bible study, I'm talking to me about Jesus and the Gospels. I think you would love it. 
And um, it's a stretch for some folks, but it's a good one. So I think you would, you would love to do that with a group of, of your uh, brothers and sisters here in the church. You might meet some new people even. So in the midst of all of that, um, with, with uh, that stretching and growing, I thought about the posture of work. I remember my grandmother who hoed the garden with a short hoe. Now she had a long hoe. And the reason I remember that is because whenever we, my mom and I would see a snake, we would get my grandma to come kill the snake because we were afraid of the snake. Didn't matter what kind, usually they were um, uh, cottonmouths or water moccasins where we lived. So we knew to be careful with the snakes. But my grandma, with her walker, at 90 years old, would come over holding um, the walker and her big hoe in one hand. And one flat of snake would be gone, and we didn't have to worry about it anymore. And I was really embarrassed that I had to count on my 90 year old grandma to kill a snake. But I did. So um, that was that. Was that. So, but she held, and she'd bend over. And I, she would be bent over for the longest, going down those rows of vegetables, you know, weeding. I remember my dad with the beehives that were full of honey. They had super on super on top of super on top of super. And he would bend all the way down in a full slot and count on those knees and the strength of his legs to lift those boxes of honey and put those up on a truck that was about neck high. I remember that. I remember him tying down loads of bees um, to uh, go to North Dakota under the big net on the 18 wheelers and he, there's something called a bee knot and he would tie the bee knot and it's a kind of a slip knot. He would, he would jump off the top of the load and rappel down the side. This is true. And as he did, that, that rope would get tighter and tighter and tighter and he would tie it off at the bottom end up being on the ground. I remember the posture of hard work from, from those people, working out one's salvation and all the things we do that God calls us to do, like going to church, like going to Sunday school, like going to Bible study, like singing in the choir, like serving on a committee, like whatever it is we do. God calls us to do those things in a posture of prayerful work. Today, we're talking about pressing on to a goal. Now this is Paul at the end of this passage of scripture, and he's using the image of athleticism to um, talk about what it means to conquer a goal or to press on toward a goal, if you will. Now, I have to tell you, I am about the least athletic person on the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, um, I had to run um, to pass a couple classes in my life. We had to run to um, pass high school physical education. I had to run to pass college physical education. That was a fun experience. We also had to swim. That was also a fun experience, but that's another sermon. Um, at any rate, I made it, and I'm so glad I passed those classes because if I had to take them again, I don't know if I could have made it another time. Now, what I can do is walk, and I love to walk. You know, walk most days. Um, and I walk, I can walk a fairly long distance if, if I'm not recovering from COVID. But for the most part, I am not an athlete at all. Now, I have to share with you something. Um, a couple weeks ago, Patty Bassett, who worships in her first service, came and she um, showed me this. So this is her 5K finishing medal. Um, Patty is like me. She's a walker. She doesn't run. And she finished um, a 5K. This is um, a fundraiser for a hospital in Guatemala. And she said, the only reason I, I did this was because I was asked to, and they needed the money. So, you know, you have to pay your entry fee and all that. And she walked, and, and she did, and she did really well, and she finished, and she said, my whole goal was just, oh God, let me finish. Don't let me be the last person, or don't let me be the, the one that comes in so late, it's dark, and you've got this motorcycle police officer riding by, you know, with the flashing lights to provide light because you're the last one to cross. I know what I'm talking about. That last person, that would be me. 
Okay, but not only did Patty win her participation thing, she won a third place medal for her age category. Now I think that's pretty cool. And so um, I asked her, I called her yesterday and said, can I borrow your medals for, for church tomorrow? And, uh, and she told me a little bit more about the situation and everything. And I just thought it's important. It's important to be in a race. It's important, it's important to try. Now, we're not talking about a physical race, obviously. We're talking about another kind of goal. And I want to be careful with the wording here so I say it correctly. Um, the goal here is to press on toward a prize that is before us. And this isn't just for athletes. This is for all of us. Back in Paul's time, only one person won a race. You didn't have second place and third place and honorable mention, and there were no participation medals. The winner got the crown, the world, and you can guess what that crown was made out of. Here's a trivia question for you. Celery. It was made out of celery leaves. That's a fact. Go figure, right? I have learned something new this week when I was researching for the sermon. So one person would win. But really, this race is an individual race that Paul is talking about. He is talking about what it means when we are called to get our act together for our faith. Now, I'm going to be transparent here. If you read carefully the whole passage that was read this morning, it's very evident that the thing that Paul is striving to reach is something called the resurrection of the dead. And when I say that these days, people go, but you have to remember, in Paul's time, folks really thought that, that was going to be happening pretty quickly. Remember in another place when Paul wrote, he said, now, if you really want to get married, get married, but I'm not going to get married because there's not going to be time to get married. You want to have children, you have children, but I'm not going to do that because there's not going to be time to do that. They truly believed that Christ was going to come and this would be resolved in their lifetime. So it was different than what we think of. So I try to reframe it. And I'm going to reframe the goal of this prize. It's still the resurrection of the last day. There's no question. But um, I'm going to reframe the prize as maturity in faith. Maturity in faith. Maturity in faith has nothing to do with maturity in age. Oh, if it just did. I would be so much farther along than I am. But I'm just not. And I have known children who are very mature in faith, and I have known very mature people age-wise who are not mature in faith. And that is just the way we are as human beings. We're all at different points in our race. But we have to be facing the finish line. We have to be facing the place we're going to end up being. As, as with Patty wanting to finish the race, Paul's job, Paul's task, Paul's goal was to finish the race well. Now, what is the posture of a runner? I had to do some research on this, too. This is how I learned about the celery wreath, by the way. So I learned that, um, it, and I knew this already, that it depends on your, your event, right? So whether you run one way or another way may depend on the distance. If you're a sprinter, if you're a distance runner. I had students who were um, cross-country runners. And my cross-country runners um, from the high school in my last church I served ran barefoot. I don't know how they did it. And they ran long distances. And they ran literally across anything. It was pretty amazing, I thought. So you're going to run differently depending on your event. But there's some general things you can say. So one thing is you have to look towards the horizon. 
You're supposed to keep your head up and kind of centered over your shoulders, not sticking out like a turtle, which is, I think, what I've been running a lot. Now, in all honesty, if I kept my eye on the horizon when I walk, I would trip over the sidewalk because it's not particularly even in some places. So I keep my head kind of focused down, and you do too when you're out on the sidewalk, I don't know. But I know I have to. That's one of the things. Um, it also talked about leaving your shoulders relaxed and your arms relaxed and your arms in at the side and your hands relaxed. And no matter what strike you used with your foot, toe, uh, the ball of the foot first, the heel or the flat part of the foot first, you were always to center your, your weight, the middle point of gravity, where your foot landed on each um, step as you ran, right? Each stride as you ran. So those are some, some typical postures of, of the athleticism of learning. What about spiritual postures of making it through this race that we call a life of faith? trying to get where we need to be. Well, we know about prayer, we know about worship, we know about all those kinds of things that God calls us to do. We understand all of those are important. And Paul goes on and he says a few more things that applies to that image. Now, the first thing is a little confusing. He says in verse 13, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it or this goal my own. If you read before that one verse, he says, if somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead, from, from the dead, not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So he doesn't assume he's one already. Y'all remember that tortoise and hare story, right? And the hare that assumed and assumed their way to losing that race because the tortoise was able to be careful and plod away and make cross that finish line first. We know that story. Well, the same thing goes with us. Arrogance and athleticism don't go well together. For those of you who are athletes, golfers, uh, other kinds of athletes. Athleticism and arrogance don't go well together. Just when you start feeling pretty sure about yourself is when you're going to do something dumb, right? That's just kind of the way it is. So the bishop that ordained me was Bruce Blake, and he has gone to glory now, but he told a great story about being in high school. He was a quarterback of the football team. He was not the running back, he was a quarterback, and he'd never gotten to actually run the ball down the field for a touchdown. So his senior year, the second to the last home game, um, they were right on the brink. They were like four points behind, and there was just a few seconds left on the clock, and he threw the ball to the running back, the running back fumbled it, it got batted up several times. He ended up catching it, and he took off down the field. And he said it was my dream to cross um, the goal line carrying the football and to score. And he got so much wrapped up into this dream that he had, and he could just imagine the people cheering and hear the crowds. But he didn't normally carry the football with him. So as he ran, it got too far over his knee in it, and you know what happened. So it fumbled, and they lost. And he had a great sermon illustration for the rest of his life, because I probably heard him tell it then three or four times over the years. So we can't assume we've got it together. Folks, if we act like we have already done everything God wants us to do, if we, if we think we have already matured in faith past the point that God could ever want us to do anything else, we need to take another look in the mirror. All of us, each one of us, especially me, I have so far to go. And I just, sometimes I think, I just don't think I'll have enough time to get there. I want to get there, 
But I want to press ahead as best I can. And I hope you want that too. As you grow in faith, as you become mature in faith, so that when you come to the point of death and you face Jesus Christ, you will be closer to Christ like than you ever were before in your life. That is our ultimate goal as people of faith. John Wesley called something similar to that Christian perfection. The word perfection does not mean the same to us today as it meant to him. But it's important to understand that this is a process and that we are running this period of time together. Then we have to keep our mind in the present and not get hung up in the mistakes of our past. Verses 13 B and C. This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I have seen in high school and middle school, especially middle school, track meets, which I used to go to all of those. I went to all of everything pretty much. And Beth and I had the interview, so to do. And I remember seeing kiddos run, and if somebody was ahead, they would turn around and look over their shoulder. You know what I'm talking about? And what happens when you turn around and look over your shoulder? You can't, if you're, if you're me, you're gonna fall, for sure. Uh, but you lose, you lose time. You lose serious time. So the goal is to keep your eyes on the prize, to keep your eyes on the finish line, to keep your eyes on where you're going, and to stay in the present. How many of us get so tripped up by something we tried years ago that we won't try it again? Somebody said last week, Pastor, I know you really want me to do this gospel. Bible study thing in January. I know you really do. I tried a Bible study once. I did. And you know, the first time I got there and they said open the whatever, 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 and it was some obscure Old Testament book and I couldn't find it and I was embarrassed. And then they called me to read. And I was here, I couldn't pronounce the words, but I tried my best and I messed up some because people laughed at me and I decided I was never going back to Bible study again. Let that go. We don't teach like that anymore. That should never have happened. Should never have happened. We don't teach like that anymore. And so I would advise you, please, um, don't let something that happened a long time ago get in the way of what you want to do now. My precious grandma, when she was a little girl, she was in a boarding school because her mother had died early. Her father was a Confederate war veteran. He was in his 70s when she was born. It's a really interesting story. But she was in a boarding school and they sang one day for music class and the choir director came and said, he called her Zella. He said, Miss Zella, we want you to just move your mouth and not sing because you can't sing. My grandma lived to be 94 years old and she never sang another note. So whenever I would ask her, she said, I can't sing. My teacher told me I can't. We can't let what's behind us keep us from moving on. She could have been in our choir. You can be in our choir. We've got lots of places you can be and lots of fun things you can do. So we can't let our past mess us up. We have to keep our eyes ahead what God is going to do for us. And the word picture of pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call in Christ Jesus is something we only do by the power of the Holy Spirit, folks. We cannot do it by ourselves. It's not something we can ever do. And we don't do it without God's power. We don't do it without one another. So Paige Bassett, Patty's daughter, and you do know, um, is indeed a runner. And I don't know that she's run many marathons, but she's walked a number of them. That would be the height of majesty for me to even consider doing that. 
and she and a friend of Lynn's walked the Honolulu Marathon in December of 2021, and it set that as a goal. So it's 26.2 miles approximately. It's 26.2 in a few feet, basically, if, if I remember correctly. And so they were 25 miles in. They were by no means the last ones. There are whole communities of people who walk marathons now. They start later, they go to the end, and there's whole communities, of, so they have clubs of people that walk marathons. So they were back there walking and doing well in the cross line, my marker for 25, and they saw a woman sitting on the ground. And they went over and they said, do you need help? Because she was obviously distraught, and she said, I can't make it. He said, do you need a medic? She said, no, I just know I can't make it. And Paige, being Paige, said, well, you're one mile away. I think you can make it. And so without giving her a choice, Liz got on one side of her and Paige got on the other side of her and they walked away. It took another hour walking another mile, getting her toward the finish line. And when she came into view, people at the finish line ran and, and picked her up and carried her the rest of the way. So she was in between them on their shoulders and she just kind of, they just hauled her in. And they all got their medal. They all got their medal for finishing a 26.2 my race. Now, I don't know for sure, but I have a hunch that if I make it to heaven, which I hope I will, it won't just be because of my effort. It's going to be on the arms and the shoulders of all the people that have helped me along the way. My Sunday school teachers, the people that paid for the Sunday school curriculum that I didn't even think about as a kid, right? Um, the youth group people, the people that drove the vans to the camps and all the different things I went to, the people that volunteered, all of those people, professors, even professors I didn't like. All of those people will help me cross whatever line I'll cross someday assuming I'm privileged enough to cross it. Because it's a matter of doing it together. Christians who live a solitary lives without community just don't do well by and large. And unless you are a prisoner of war or a political prisoner of some sort, and there may have been some kid of this here, I don't know, but unless you've been in that situation, it's really important to know that the church community is where the action is. This is where we need to be. We're called to be with one another because none of us are getting over that line without the effort of a few other folk to help us along the way. And a whole lot of power from the Holy Spirit. That is the posture of pressing forward toward the prize. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision. We're gonna sing one verse, and then I'll pronounce the benediction, and then we will sing the last verse as I walk out and uh, have a prayer. So glad that you worshiped with us today.
Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.